Um, coming up here, we have a panel discussion um, with the overarching topic of studying in Germany. Um, we'll be talking to four panelists who have studied abroad in Germany or done an exchange or spent time in Germany. We'll be learning about um, what sparked their interest uh, in German, how doing an exchange in Germany or studying in Germany um, affected or impacted both their academic and professional career. And we'll also be hearing some advice, some helpful tips <laughs> for those of you who may also be interested in taking that next step and studying in Germany. So at this point, I would like to invite uh, Robert Bloom, Michelle Belorshi, Francis Esquivel, and Nathaniel Long to join me here on the screen. Um, you can go ahead and unmute your cameras and unmute your microphones. I'll start out um, while you all are setting this up to um, just briefly introduce you to everyone, um, give a little background about you. And after that, um, I would just go alphabetical order since we're in a Zoom room here and it's a little more difficult um, and just have some questions that I'll give each of you the chance to answer in a couple of minutes. Um, and for this panel discussion, um, this is your chance uh, for everyone listening in, for all of the attendees, to ask your most burning questions to those who have been in this position, have studied in Germany, or in Francis's case, is currently still studying in Germany and will be finishing up soon. Um, so I'll start with Robert Bloom. I see you first here on my screen. Um, Robert is a dear colleague of mine at the Goethe Institute New York. He's a language program officer at the Goethe Institute New York. He was born and raised in New York. He holds a BA in German language and literature from Hunter College and an MA in German studies from the University of Colorado. He studied for one semester as an exchange student at the Pädagogische Hochschule Karlsruhe and he served as an English teaching assistant for one year at a gymnasium in Bergisch Gladbach through the Fulbright, Fulbright program. Before beginning his current position at the Goethe Institute in New York, Robert worked as a buyer for an online retailer selling on Amazon.de and taught German classes at the University of Colorado and Hunter College. Welcome, Robert. Good afternoon. <laughs> we also have with us um, Francis Esquivel. I see you are already here. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. If not, you may correct me. <laughs> um, no, it's Fran <laughs> Wonderful. Frances is currently a student at the University of Cologne, so she is joining us from a little bit of a different time zone. She's six hours ahead. Thank you for taking the time this evening. Um, at the University of Cologne, she's working towards earning a bachelor degree in geosciences. After graduating from Dana Hills High School in 2013, she took a four-year break to pursue a career in fashion and moved to New York City. During this time, she traveled abroad to different European countries for work-related opportunities. In 2017, she moved to Germany with no prior experience in the language and started studying at the university uh, about a year later. Um, her future plans, including continuing her education and also earning a master's degree from a German university. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and then we also, I see Daniel, you are also already here. Thank you so much. Um, Nathaniel Long is currently a security engineering officer in the Foreign Service with the US Department of State. He graduated from the University of Alabama in Huntsville in 2018 with an aerospace engineering degree and a minor in German. He then went on to the Ohio State University where he graduated with a master's of public administration in 2019. Uh, during his undergraduate studies, he spent two semesters in Bremen in Germany at the Hochschule Bremen through the UAS 7 program. And that's the program we learned about earlier in the day. Uh, so if you had any outstanding questions, now would also be a good time to pose those to him, um, as well as attending a four-week intensive German language program through the Berliner ID. Um, we also have Michelle Belorshi joining us. Um, we are having some technical difficulties with her. If she can join, I'll just catch up on her introduction and have her um, join us as well. So we'll be figuring that out behind the scenes. Uh, but we have the three of you here now. I think we'll take this opportunity to go ahead and get started. Um, I'd just like to start with a very overarching question. Um, just in general, it's always very interesting uh, for students to hear what sparked your personal or professional interest in German. Um, it's always a very interesting question, um, and there's always so many different answers that you get. 
Um, so I'll have Robert answer that question first. What led you towards German? So in my case, it was a somewhat in, impulsive and emotional decision um, because I started learning German only in college. Uh, I have no no German family. I had French in high school. Um, and I actually just took German in college because my real goal had been to study political science because my dream had been to work for the United Nations. And I thought, well, you know, first year of college, you have some freedom. I'll take a German class because I, I was interested and can't hurt to have more languages if you want to work for the UN. And I just found, well, I don't really like political science, but I really like my German classes. So I switched my majors, kept going and, and didn't stop. And here I am. Very nice. Um, I just want to briefly say, Michelle, we are glad <laughs> that you are here with us now. I'd just like to um, briefly just introduce you so everyone knows who we have in this room right now. Um, so Michelle uh, Balorchi, you can tell me if I am butchering your name, <laughs> um, currently serves as an outreach and recruitment specialist as IIE. And if I'm not mistaken, that's the International Institute of Education. Um, for the Fulbright Scholars Program. Prior to joining Fulbright, she was based at IAE's office in New Delhi, India, where she recruited for NYU's campus in Abu Dhabi. She completed a dual major in international studies and German at California State University, Long Beach, where she had the opportunity to do an exchange in Oldenburg, Germany. After a short stint teaching elementary school, she headed back to Germany to serve as an English teaching assistant through Fulbright. So we have another Fulbright participant in here. Uh, she holds an MA in Global Studies from the University of Freiburg in Germany. Uh, Michelle was a faculty at ITT Technical Institute before moving to India, where she completed a Master's in Philosophy, uh, MPhil, I'm not sure what that stands for, maybe you can explain that for me later, in Sociology of Education. She has worked in the field of international education since 2014. A California native, Michelle and her spouse are currently based in Washington, D.C., which is where I'm also located, so welcome, Michelle. Um, we're just now going through some general questions and are looking to hear um, what sparked your personal or prof professional interest in German. I'm going in the order of how you appear on my screen. So Michelle, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what drew you to German or how you ended up doing something with German. Sure, thank you, Eileen. <clears throat> so my story is a little similar to Robert's. I wanted to work for the UN or be an ambassador or you know, something of that nature that had to do with international relations and international education specifically. Um, I had already, coming from Southern California, your choices are really Spanish or French in school. So after doing Spanish in school, I started German in college just because it was something different. And also because I had studied um, piano, I had learned to play the piano and most of the composers that I had learned were German speaking, Beethoven, Mozart, etc. And so I was intrigued by um, the history of these musicians and a lot of the manuscripts, you know, the, what you learn is in German for music. So I thought that would be a fun thing to do. I didn't have any family or any history, particularly with German. Um, and so I walked into my first German class at Cal State. There were just five of us and we were able to learn so quickly and it just took off from there. And so I think the first opportunity I had in Germany really set my trajectory for where I am now. Yeah, and seeing a little bit of a, um, we call it a rota fad and a red thread yeah. here with our yeah. first two speakers, just completely yeah. a little by random, but it kind of stuck. <laughs> um, so Francis, um, your case is a little different here. You're still in the process of obtaining your degree. Uh, what sparked your interest in German or even studying in Germany? Well, to start off, I do have family that um, come from Frankfurt. Um, so I have an uncle here. So throughout my life, they've already been kind of mentioning the idea of me coming over to Germany and, or at least just learning the language and learning where he comes from. Um, so that kind of boosted my interest a little bit, but um, all in all, I actually really wanted to study in Germany because it just seemed the most feasible for me in terms of um, um, university wise, because I was looking um, in terms of where I wanted to study and I looked in universities in um, the US and also in England, but it didn't really click with me at the time. And when I visited Germany, I really felt more at home here. Um, so it just kind of stuck, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Very nice. And then we'd, of course, also like to hear from Nathaniel. This is why we invited you here today. <laughs> um, would you like to tell us a little bit about um, what drew you to German? What sparked your personal or your professional interest? Yeah, happy to. Um, so mine kind of starts uh, a little bit uh, from family reasons. Um, way back, you know, over 100 years ago, on my dad's side, my family came over from Germany, and it just kind of lived on in, in the oral history. So Thanksgiving was always the big holiday with that side of the family. Um, and yeah, as you're sitting around, dinner gets going, the, the older people start reaching back further and further for those stories. Um, and they just kind of talked about, uh, you know, my, my grandmother would talk about her grandparents only knowing German. Um, and so kind of had this, this uh, family connection. Um, my one aunt, she's really big into genealogy and so has tracked that side of the family back to like the 1600s in Germany. Uh, so it's just kind of always been in the background. And I ended up taking a few German classes in high school. Uh, in Kentucky, you had to have some sort of a foreign language. And I really liked the German teacher. And also everybody was like, you know, you, you come out of the German classes, at least knowing something. Um, so I, I wanted the academic challenge. And I thought I was done after high school. Um, but when I got to, to college, my, my first semester, I only had 12 credit hours. I felt like that was a little lazy, um, but nothing nothing would fit. And so I said, okay, fine, I'll take German 101. I remember some of the, the grammar, it should be an easy A. Um, and again, was reminded of how much I love studying the language after high school and met some people and some lifelong friends that were really serious about it. And that's kind of what, what pushed me to continue and led to me eventually studying abroad. Um, professionally, I'm an engineer. You know, when you think of great engineering, the you know it's kind of a joke and a stereotype, but it really is Germany. So, um, wanting to study a language, both with that kind of family connection, and then also what would be hopefully useful professionally, is what what pushed me to German. Absolutely, and I, I think it's funny that you mentioned the easy A. Um, usually, it's something. I remember when I was um, teaching German as a TA, I always heard the opposite. I don't want to take German because it's so hard, and you kind of have to clear up that German is actually not that difficult of a language. You know, it's much easier than English. Someone else learning that language, and there's also a lot of cognates. You know, you have house and house and hand and hunt. Um, so it's just funny that you mentioned the easy A because I had never. <laughs> heard that before. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. It looks like uh, we come from a lot of different backgrounds and interests here in terms of what uh, drew us to German and the background we have with it. Um, I'd like to go a little bit um, deeper now, so to say, um, and really go into the study abroad part because that's our studying in Germany part because that's what we're all here um, to hear about. Um, so my next question, um, and I'll try just kind of throwing this out in the room to see if anyone wants to answer it first. Um, a reminder to everyone here, if you do have questions, you can type them in the Q&A. We're going to make some time at the end. You can let us know if you have questions for individuals, um, any one of them here, um, and we'll get to those at the very end. Um, so let's talk about how uh, studying abroad in Germany or doing doing an exchange, like actually spending that time over there impacted uh, your academic or your professional career. Um, what was special about it? What, you, what did you take uh, from that experience and how did it, so to say, boost um, <laughs> your academic or professional career track? Or, um, you know, in another case, uh, how do you think it may <laughs> if you're still in that process? And I will let you uh, decide here who wants to go first. We can keep the order that we had before. I'll completely leave that up to you. <laughs> I, I'd be happy to go first. So I, I would say in my case, um, I'm the language program officer for the Goethe Institute New York, which means my job is helping people learn the German language and giving advice. So I can start by talking to the importance of being in Germany for improving your German. Uh, and and what, what is very important to understand when learning a language or when teaching a language now, because this is spoken about a lot in modern language teaching classes, um, is the importance of psychological factors in using a language. Because when, when you think about how am I going to learn German, how am I going to reach real proficiency, 
a lot of students are probably thinking about, well, I got to crack open that grammar book. I have to know all the tenses. I need to understand all the cases. I need to know all the words that I see when I open up uh, work from Kafka or Goethe. But the other half of learning a language is being able to master all of the psychological barriers that come into play when you're using language. Things like um, the anxiety of being around native speakers, uh, things like what, what are called performance errors, which are when you know the correct words and you know the correct grammar, but then when you have to actually use them in real time, you still make the mistake, even though you immediately know after you said it, oh wait, that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And there's no substitute for mastering those psychological barriers to actually being in the country where you're exposed to the language on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, you know, I thought when I was, when I'm, before I went abroad, I thought, well, okay, I feel pretty good with my knowledge of German. But then I found myself, to give one example of many in my, my six months, the first time I lived in Germany, I found myself for the very first time where I had been invited to a dinner party. And I was the only person there who was not German. And I suddenly found everything that I felt I had mastered in college up until that point just fell apart. And I think that whole night, in three hours, I probably spoke two whole sentences not because I couldn't speak German, but because suddenly being around three other native speakers, I had all the anxiety of, oh, I'm going to say something wrong. Oh, I'm going to make a fool of myself. And that night was, and I'm sure everyone here had a similar experience. That was not a pleasant night at the end. I went home feeling, maybe I can't speak German. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing, but it was a very important moment for overcoming those anxieties was to face it and see, oh, okay, there's a lot more to, to using the language than I realized. Um, and, and with study abroad, I was able to uh, come out of it feeling a lot more confident when I had to be in those real world situations. Thank you very much. Um, Francis, I have you next on my screen. So we'll just go in the order uh, as I'm seeing you here. Um, if you wanna speak a little bit uh, to how your time that you're spending in Germany right now um, is impacting or could impact your academic or professional career. You already talked a little bit about the reasons why um, you'd like to fill us in a little more. Well, yeah, I can totally second to what um, Robert was saying about the psychological um, part of speaking a language. Um, it's so different than when you're learning the language in the country you're in um, or you're from and in the country that it's commonly spoken in. So for example, you're always having input from this language um, on, the, on a daily basis, whether you're not, or whether you're um, just going out shopping or just living life, you know, you're always being in it. Um, and so with that, you also get, um, you also have the chance to practice more because when you need help from somebody, you have to speak to them in German. I mean, of course, everyone here in Cologne speaks English. That's not gonna be a problem, but, um, it just really, yeah, you just, you're more exposed to it when you're living in Germany. Um, and other than that, academically wise, I feel like I'm working a lot harder than a lot of my peers because um, in my program at the University of Cologne, there's no other foreign student or anyone who comes from a, a country that's not German speaking. Um, so, I mean, we have some people from Austria and um, Liechtenstein, but, um, no North Americans, South Americans. I'm the only one there. And so I feel like, you know, learning um, and studying in a different language really activates that part of your brain where you have to think twice about what you're reading in literature. Um, and so it just, it really encourages me to work harder academically wise, just to actually understand the concepts instead of reading a bunch of, a bunch of words. <laughs> Um, are you in a program? We heard about English speaking programs, uh, undergraduate programs this morning. Is your program completely in German or is it a hybrid format? Uh, that would just interest me. Um, it's completely in German. I had one course, um, but other than that, everything, all the literature recommendations and the PowerPoints, lectures, everything is in German. And, and how did you um, how did you prepare yourself for that? What did you do in terms of you know upping your your German language ability? What was the process there? Did you take courses? Um, did you do the Studienkolleg? How did that look? Um, yeah, so I attended a language school for the first year I was here, and at the end of the year, I took the test staff, which is um, Test Deutsch als Fremdsprache, um, and then. 
before I enrolled in, well, I enrolled at the University of Cologne, but they have this program called Studienstadt International. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically a pre-semester that prepares you for real university, I guess, as a foreign student. A lot of people who are doing an exchange are also doing this program. So um, a lot of the foreigners um, are kind of grouped together. So we kind of have this feeling of camaraderie with each other. Um, and so with that, we had a mixture of courses that were with regular German students and courses that helped us with integration and also um, a language course with it as well. Yeah, because of course, you know, the intercultural aspects are important too, especially if it's your first time, you know, go, we're going overseas, just knowing what the cultural differences might be and how to react to those. Um, and we did, for those who we hear this, here this morning, we did hear about the Studienstadt International pro Program. So you're here kind of repping as an alumni for a program that we had um, in one of our presentations this morning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Nathaniel, you're here next on my screen. So I'll switch over to you. Um, you did spend some time in Germany. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about how that impacted uh, your career, be it academic or professional? We'd love to hear it. Yeah, so um, definitely academically, I think getting that study abroad experience was the, the motivation to, to finish out, take my last three German courses to get a minor. It didn't help that my German professor basically looked at me and said, I want you in my lit class. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to basically say, you got conversation by living in Germany for 10 months. Um, so I, I would have the prereq to be in his lit class. Um, so, so academically, that's, that's kind of the big thing there. Um, but professionally, um, so, so my study abroad experience, uh, I was in an entirely English program. So I like to think it was the best of both worlds. I got to, to learn German and live there, but also, you know, do all the engineering work in English. Um, but Bremen as a university is very, very, very big into study abroad. Um, I'm going to probably butcher these numbers, but I think three quarters of their students do some sort of study abroad experience and they have tons of, of international students from all over the world. Um, so I was on a design team that was myself, a German student, a Polish student. Um, and I just absolutely loved how we thought about things differently. Um, you know, we, we had the same requirements, you know, same goal, but just how we got to, to answers and problem solved was, was fascinating. And I think that's when I realized I wanted a career that was somehow international. Um, and, and didn't even realize the foreign service was an option at that point. Um, where I'm at now is, is an accidental conversation that I had with a former security engineer um, at an event. But because I said, I wanna do engineering abroad because I'd had this study abroad experience, he was like, hey, this is something that I think would really interest you. Um, so studying abroad is great because you can really learn what you like and what you don't like. And you haven't committed to a career or you know, a family to a move, you know, it's, it's, mine was 10 months. I'm a firm believer in you can survive anything for 10 months, two years. Um, so, so for me, I got that, that taste of, of living abroad. Um, and then I was also in the study internship program. So I spent the last uh, semester actually working. Um, and I was doing a lot of business development for, for a company back in the States. So I, it wasn't just the, the study aspect. It was like, I, did really learn to appreciate how Germans do business, um, how Europe does business. And so, like I said, I got that, that taste and I could then make a decision. Yeah, this is something I want to keep pursuing in my career or something that maybe isn't for everybody. Um, and because I knew that and I could say I wanted that, people pointed me in directions uh, and career opportunities where I could, could continue to develop that. Thank you. I mean, they, you know, they say you, um... Don't regret the opportunities you didn't take or you can't. Um, I thought it was really interesting that you said it was such, you know, an international group. You know, you had someone from Poland there. What was, I would, I would be interested in hearing what kind of your common language there was. Was it German? Was it English? Was it something else entirely, body language? <laughs> <laughs> it did end up being English because uh, like I said, the, the classes that we were taking were all done in English. So all of our um, reports had to be in English, um, which ended up being, I did a lot of technical editing because come to find out Polish doesn't have articles. So 
every single sentence my Polish colleague wrote didn't have any thes or a's <laughs> in English. Um, so I still give him a hard time about that. Um, yeah, big difference to German where we have um, many articles. Der, die, das, um, and you know, pick your choice. You have a one in three chance of getting that one correct. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'd also like to move on to Michelle um, and hear about how your time abroad, I mean, you weren't, you know, just in Germany, you were all over. <laughs> and just hear um, how the time, your time abroad and the experiences and, you know, you gathered how that affected or impacted um, what you're doing now or where you are now. Sure. So I think everything can be traced back to that first German class I went to at Cal State, which then got me interested in studying abroad in Germany because my initial plan was to study abroad in London. And when I think everyone goes there actually. So I thought, well, Germany would be good because I can also learn a language. And so this is actually Oldenburg that I have right behind me. It's the Rathausplatz where we used to spend some time. So, um, and a lot of the information I might share with you, things might have changed, but because um, I studied abroad in 2002 and then I completed my master's in 2009, but it also helps you to get an, an idea of where you could be even 10 years after you do your study abroad in Germany or 15 years after, where how it continues to impact you on, you know, professionally and um, personally. So I ended up studying not just one semester in Oldenburg, but three, <laughs> because it just was the most magical experience being um, in another country, learning not only another language, but a new culture. And as the other panelists have pointed out, you also meet so many other international exchange students or international students pursuing their degrees in Germany. So it was this whole opening to the world, you know, and coming from Southern California, which can be its own little bubble, this was really an amazing experience. And so I kept on extending. And so I stayed three semesters. I was also quite fluent at that time. So I was comfortable with what I had learned, but I can relate to Robert's experience where after two and a half years at Cal State, you know, I thought I had really done some, you know, great progress learning German and I met the exchange students there, but, um, and they would say, oh, you, your accent's perfect or your fast license, you're almost, you know, fluent. And then I get to a, you know, these college parties in Oldenburg and I got, or in the classes, the classes were really, and I thought, oh my gosh, I know nothing, you know? <laughs> so that's why I really thought I can't leave until I've mastered this, you know? But um, altogether, I spent four years in Germany. And um, I would say to the, the audience that is here, whether you're in high school or you're in college and you're thinking about studying abroad, um, you should absolutely do it. And you, know, you never really know where things are gonna take you. And I would say also the biggest thing, having studied in South Africa and India as well, Germany is very student friendly. Um, not just the fact that it's a great, value. You don't really pay any fees. Um, at least that's what the case was when I was there. I know that I think the state of Bayern is thinking of introducing kind of a fee system for international students. But um, there are so many things, just the rent is cheaper. There's so many student discounts. You can get your semester ticket and go use all of the public transportation for you know less than $150 um, per semester. It's just, it's a very student-friendly country. And um, my friend at the same time when I was in Germany, she studied in France and we were kind of comparing things. I think it was also pretty similar for her, but we were both impressed at how student friendly being in Europe was um, for the both of us. And she's actually continued to um, stay on in France and she teaches English there. But um, I would just say that the one semester, whether it's or the one month, or the full year you do in Germany is always, it, it's gonna have an impact on you. It's gonna open so many doors. I think studying abroad in general um, will benefit you. So whether you settle for Germany or Austria or Switzerland or somewhere that's not German speaking, I highly recommend it. And um, that, it was funny because I was actually thinking the other day about this, the semesters that I spent in Oldenburg because it's the rainiest, one of the rainiest cities in Germany, <laughs> Everyone talks about Freiburg, where it's you know quite sunny and you've got solar powered, you know, technology going on, right? So that piqued my interest in um, the city of Freiburg, and that's where I found the master's program. 
But in between, I got the Fulbright English teaching assistantship and I taught one year in Trier um, and I lived right by the Porta Nigra, which is the, that main gate, kind of, you know, the, the black Roman gate. That, and it was just a magical time. But I would say that one semester in Oldenburg got me to thinking about Freiburg. I found the master's program there. It's all in English. So I know that somebody asked a question about it. Sorry, I accidentally moved it to the answered section. But that master's program was absolutely phenomenal. We started and ended in Germany. It's still going on. They now offer it not only in Freiburg, but in Berlin. And um, the second semester was in South Africa. That was wonderful. And the third semester was in India, where I ended up meeting my future spouse. So that took me on to another trajectory where I got a, a degree, a master of philosophy and sociology. Um, I worked in our IIE office over there. So it's just, and I learned another language completely different <laughs> that I didn't anticipate learning was Hindi. But I think this is just shows you how one door opens and several other. I mean, you just really never know where things are going to take you. And now I recruit for the Fulbright Scholar Program, sending faculty to Germany or to India, et cetera. And so it's just a wonderful opportunity to, to continue to work with colleagues in Germany and colleagues in India. And even Eva, I was in contact with Eva Bosbach um, a couple of years ago about Fulbright. So it's a small world. Um, so I would definitely recommend going to Germany. Well, thank you so much. Um, you heard it here first. If you're unsure, do a semester. And then if you like it, add another and then add another. <laughs> it doesn't have to be the full commitment. Um, I do want to um, save because we have quite a few questions coming in for the Q&A when we have 15 minutes, um, and this might kind of overlap a little bit. What I'd like to hear from each of you is um, what advice you would give to those who are listening here um, who are learning German. Um, we already heard, you know, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, are also for those who are, um, you know, they decide, I want to go study abroad, I want to go study in Germany, where do you start? Um, any tips that you might have or advice for those listening? Um, I think we'd love to hear it here and we'll go through that and then we'll open up um, the Q&A and to everyone listening, if you have questions as we're going along, even to uh, specific panel speakers, there's a little Q&A feature in the bottom middle of your screen, feel free to type it in. So I'll go ahead and start with Robert again. Um, we'd love to hear any advice you have for those interested in studying Germany, learning German now, they decided they want to do it, where do, what do I do, where do I start? And you could maybe even speak specifically to Fulbright uh, since that that's the direction you went. Yeah, so I can give to, to because I did see the question as well of how do you get started. Um, if you're looking at studying abroad, in most cases, you'll probably be going through some exchange program with your university. Most universities have some sort of good exchange set up. In my case, I went to Kazwa, not because I picked it out, but because that was the exchange that my university had. And I was very grateful for that because Kazwa is a great choice. Uh, with regards to the Fulbright, I, I assume that the process is still similar to when I did this nine years ago. but you had the opportunity in the application to list three German states in order of preference. And I don't remember what my other two were, but one of the states I had written was um, Nordrhein-Westfalen. Um, so I got placed into that state. And then within that state, I was put into a, a city that um, that wasn't of my choice. But in my case, I was put into Bergisch Gladbach, which is basically a suburb of Cologne, uh, which I was very happy with because it's both a bit a quieter suburban area, but also if you wanted the city vibe, it was just a half hour S-Bahn ride into the heart of Cologne. Um, to, to answer the question of what advice would I have, in a lot of cases, you may not have a choice of where you're going because if your university has an exchange program, you may be going to wherever that exchange program is. But if you do have a choice, and I was on a similar panel in New York a year ago, and I'm even more firm in my answer now than I was then. Um, if you do have a choice, my advice would be to avoid Berlin or Munich. And the reason for this is that Berlin and Munich are Germany's two largest tourist destinations. They're, they're also two cities that have a very large international population. And if your goal, and this might not be the goal of everyone here, but if your goal is to improve your knowledge of the German language, the disadvantage of Berlin and Munich is because they're big tourist destinations, because they have very large international communities, you will be thrown much more often into situations where everyone is speaking English uh, the advantage of being in a smaller town like Kazwa, where I was, is that you're going to have much more 
opportunity to speak German because when you try to speak German with people, they're more likely to answer in German. Mm -hmm. In Berlin, you're much more likely to encounter the situation where you start speaking German, the person immediately notices a foreign accent and just switches to English because they're used to doing that with every other tourist who comes through. Um, so smaller towns may be more challenging because you don't have the advantage of that international support network you might have in a big city, but you're also going to be much more likely to be successful in really immersing yourself in German. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Francis, you are, like I said, I'm going through the screens we have here. Um, you're in the situation, you know, where you are still uh, studying, but you probably have, since it's, you know, still relatively fresh, uh, some advice to those saying, I want to study abroad. Where do I start? Um, or I'm going to be going abroad. What advice can you give me? We'd love to hear your um, firsthand experiences there and any advice you could give. Well, if you are pretty set on wanting to study here in Germany, you need to have all your documents um, together and you need to know which requirements you need in order to be here. So whether that is your visa or if you're looking for an apartment, you need to kind of know where to look and um, just be very organized is the biggest advice I can give you because it's very difficult sometimes if you don't have help from other people. Um, but I mean, for example, I had a lot of help from my um, my language school um, to organize my visa. They even went with me to the foreigner's office. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, but to just keep everything together, know what you need in order for um, your application at university, what documents you need to get translated and if you need insurance or not, it varies for each case, for sure. But for me, I kind of had to look it up and do my own research. It took about a couple months for me to kind of compile a list of everything. And I took this list with me and just had it with me all the time when I was um, in Germany the first month and trying to get everything together. But as an American, I was able to stay on my um, Schengen visa for the first three months. So that helped a lot. And then I eventually applied for, um, for a language school visa. And once I got accepted to university, I'm on the visa that I'm on now um, is the university visa. Thank you very much. Very important information. Um, it's not the fun part. You know, you think about going abroad and then you remember there's a lot of things to fill out, a lot of things to research. <laughs> um, Nathaniel, you're laughing. Maybe you can speak to that as well, but we'd love to hear um, if you have any advice or any tips, anything along those lines to those interested in studying Germany. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just remembering because um, I had to go back for reasons um because i wasn't technically taking classes that second semester i had to renew my visa and just trying to get all that paperwork in order because i had to show i had financial support i mean it was just you know i love germans but again the stereotype they want you know 17 copies of 17 different forms and just and then oh hey you can only go to this one visa office you know from 10 30 to 11 on tuesdays and thursdays and uh it was a little stressful till I got it all figured out. But um, the other good thing about Germans is they're very organized. So, you know, if you're at the university, they usually have a study abroad coordinator that can send you a checklist or say, hey, you know, my, mine had it, you know, three months out. This is what you need to be doing. Two months out. This is what you need to be doing. A week before you go, this is what you need to be doing. Um, so, so take advantage of those. I also uh, advocate the semester ticket um, and just make sure that when you're coming back from Hamburg at seven o'clock in the morning after having been out in Hamburg all night, you don't get on an ice train that your semester ticket doesn't work for. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in other words, uh, my tips um, coming from a little bit different background as an engineer, um, don't feel like you have to be a language major or an international studies major um, to study abroad. Um, it's harder as an engineer because your classes are more specific. You don't have as much wiggle room with electives, but it can happen. And you're also your own best advocate. So my story was um, the study abroad, you know, coordinator at my, my American university. I looked at what they had for studying in Germany and it was either like, okay, go for two weeks or, you know, maybe something that was just like, but nothing that would uh, really push me forward academically. And so I went to his office and I said, look, I want to go to Germany. I want to be there for at least a semester and I want credit for my engineering classes. Um, and once I said, this is what I want to do, we started finding ways to make that work. Um, so you know, if a program doesn't exist that meets your needs, 
ask. Uh, you know, there's people whose jobs it is to to help you find that, but they can't read your mind. Um, my last piece of advice would be once you're actually you know studying abroad, uh, take advantage of whatever cultural exchange programs there are. So Bremen, like I said, they did a lot of stuff for foreign students. So we went to the opera. Um, what else did we do? We went ice skating, which was really really fun. Um, we did like a hike up a mountain and. I was with people who had never seen snow before in their life because of where they came from. You know, didn't snow in their country. Um, they had an adopt a student program. So I still regularly talk with my, I call them my host family. I didn't live with them, but my, my host mom, um, you know, if, if we're ever allowed to travel again, I'd love to go back. And I have, I have a, a couch to sleep on several places in Germany. Um, so take advantage of those cultural exchange programs because it's either going to help you do things that you might not have realized or do things you want to do, but a lot cheaper because the university can get some discounts. Well, thank you so much. And we see um, Aneta is here on the screen and that is our signal that we um, are moving to the Q&A here. Michelle, um, maybe you can speak first on some of the questions we have, but we do have quite a lot of Q&A questions. So I will just go ahead and give it over to you, Aneta. Yes, thank you, Eileen, and thank you for all the insightful first-hand experiences you shared with us. Um, there were a number of questions. Um, I would like to, I, I bundled them a little bit into topics, so I would like to stay with the cultural aspect of staying in Germany. So one question was, um, do you primarily um, interacted with international students, or did you also have German students in your classrooms? Where, where you studied. So I can take, start out with that. So it really depends. Um, for the German language class that I was taking, it was foreigners, but that was just the one class. The rest of it, I was again in Oldenburg, which is a small town. And I second Robert's um, uh, suggestion of living in a smaller town because people there, you know, it's not a tourist attraction. You're not just another American visiting Heidelberg or Munich or whatever. So I was really, it was my intention to really focus on just speaking with Germans, answering everything in German, studying in German. Um, but of course I did have a good set of international friends because I lived in the Studentenwohnheim in the dorm. And it was a good mix of Germans and international students. And we each had our own room. So you didn't have to worry about roommates but you were always sitting together at dinner or at breakfast, et cetera. So I would say it's a mix. There's a very strong um, study abroad. Uh, you know, they have a lot of programs in Germany that attract students from all over Europe and Central Asia. You know, I had met, I, for the first time I met somebody from the Republic of Georgia. I didn't even know about that country until I went to study abroad. So you, you really do get to meet the whole world when you, when you study in Germany. Mm -hmm. So you get the best of the two worlds, so to speak. Yeah. But it's important for you to steer your, you know, to direct your interest in really learning the language. Does anybody else would like to share their experiences as far as uh, classroom experiences, how diverse that was? Yes, I, I will add that most of my classes in Kazwa were with other international students, which has the, which can be dangerous as you are inclined to speak English rather than German. Um, it also has other advantages. Like I learned uh, quite a little bit of basic Polish because quite a few of the other students were from Poland, but um, I did have a couple classes with, with Germans and some of that also came down to our own choices. You had the option to choose more courses with, uh, which would have been with the, the general German student body. Mm -hmm. So it can have some unexpected benefits too, like learning Polish in Germany. Um, okay, another, um, culture related question was um what was the biggest culture shock for you um during your first weeks in germany does anybody want to share an anecdote about that jaywalking <laughs> okay so after living in new york city for um well i lived there for three years and nobody cares whether the hand on the little signal there is red or if there's if you're allowed to walk or not. And I didn't know about this huge taboo here in Germany that you're not allowed to cross on red. And I remember the stares that people were giving me and I just felt the biggest shame in my life. Um, so that was a very big culture shock for me. 
Um, another one would be the windows in Germany. There's three settings on the windows. Um, and it's not like in the US um, where you can just, you know, open and close it. But in Germany, if you lift the handle up, um, the, the window will fall to you basically. Or, and I thought, I thought I broke the window in my apartment. I thought, oh my goodness, now I have to pay for it. But no, it's, yeah, it's just little things like that that really shocked me in my first week living here. Yeah, it's the so-called Stoßlüften, which is very typical for Germans. They always have to air out the rooms. <laughs> um, anybody else want to share a, a little story of their first weeks? Uh, I remember, old, so Oldenburg is a huge bicycle town because it's very flat. It's in northern Germany, ne next to Bremen, actually. We used to go there quite a bit. But I had a bicycle because that was the first thing you needed to get as a student. And I remember bicycling. And, and what's great in Germany is they have the sidewalks that are marked for pedestrians, cyclists, etc. And I was apparently on the wrong side of the sidewalk. So I was shouted at <laughs> by somebody saying, get on the other side. And I thought, oh, goodness, I didn't realize that we're kind of treated like cars in that sense. So, you know, the flow of traffic needs to be on the right hand side. So I think that points to that alles in Ordnung. I mean, it really what struck me was when it came down to the trash or the you know trash sorting you have five different buckets for trash or the um the bicycling or just having your paperwork in order i mean it's a huge bureaucracy but it works so i think that's the biggest takeaway is that um you know be prepared for it everything might look kind of familiar and i mean it's europe so buildings have you know really nice architecture and are very old but there are a lot of cultural differences between the us and germany that'll come through week by week month by month and so i think that's the most exciting part of not only learning a language but being in that country and learning the culture as well so mm -hmm. yeah i can totally relate to that i mean um germans will let you know if you have to tie your shoes or how to park um it's uh, yeah they they play by the rules but don't don't take it personally <laughs> no exactly <laughs> okay um what else did i want to ask you oh yeah one I question i just wanted to um chime in because it is um 247 so we're going to go into the next um presentation i want to thank you all so much for joining our panel um, my suggestion would be if any of our panel speakers would like to stick around a little longer, they could maybe answer some of the many questions we didn't get to um, in the Q&A, in the actual Q&A box here. Um, so if you have time, I know you have busy schedules, maybe um, stick around and answer some of the questions directly in the Q&A, type them in there, um, because we have a very tight schedule here and are going to be moving on. But thank you very much to each and every one of you. Um, for joining us today for the panel discussion. We really, really appreciate it.